What's up, guys? We are back here for our second live stream on Cedia virtual coverage. And we're going to be talking about HDMI 2.1 troubleshooting. We've got Sam Metivier from AV Pro Edge. How's it going, Sam? How are we doing? Awesome. Phil Jones, you're back, of course, from Sound United. We appreciate you always being here to help us cover these events. And, of course, we've got Don Dunn from HD 2020. How's it going, guys? How you? Good, good. Awesome. Like I just saw you a few minutes ago. I know, right? You've been. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to see a lot of each other in the next couple of days, which is always a good thing, at least for me. Um, so we want to talk about this HDMI 2.1 stuff because there's been a lot of distress from people about compatibility issues, especially with gaming and you know just issues with the chipsets and all this other stuff we've been covering. So what do you have in store for us, Phil, that can help people that are first embracing the HDMI 2.1 new standard, new receivers, Xbox, NVIDIA, PlayStation, all that stuff? Well, well, the first thing is, um, like I said, Sound United Products, Den and Marantz were the, one, one of the, basically one of the first ones to support HDMI 2.1. And, like and, um, and most of them support, we support up to 40 gigabits per second, which is the, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, which is about the maximum that could come out of the graphics card anyway. Um, uh, support it, and um, and we support all of the different ones. Now, originally there was some, there was a, there is some people will have on some systems they will have a little bit of a problem for select HDMI 2.1 devices. We have this little guy here that you can get. Now, before you ask for this, or these are free to anybody that has a problem. But before you ask for this, try it um, because most HDMI 2.1 devices will pass all the way through, no problem. That's more of a communication thing. The best way to think of it is everybody's speaking English, but there's one dude speaking Italian. So mm -hmm. think of this almost like a translator to make sure that everybody's speaking in the same the same way. Now, um, we're trying to find the, the, the least, the, the least, the way that you can quickly um, uh, solve any issues. Like I said, most customers who have these systems may not have a problem. If they do have a problem, um, this we will send to you pretty rapidly. Because if you look at this rack behind me, no one's going to want to pull their AVR out um, and replace and, and wait and send it back to service. Or even if we or send it out for a replacement, it could take weeks when it's just one device is having a problem. And if you could put this in, a, this takes about 10 minutes to go in and you're done. But I will tell you that um, before you even worry about that, test the devices. So whether you're looking at a gaming console um, or a um, or a um, a graphics card, um, you should be good to go. But check them, and if you have a problem, we have a solution for you. Um, so, so just to main... interrupt you, just to interrupt you real quickly, if somebody's not a gamer and if they're just streaming off of a Roku or an Apple TV, then they probably won't need that device yeah. at all, right? And that's the most important point when you get across. Um, and a little bit later, we're going to talk about it. Um, the thing that requires the most data is um, when you go to higher frame rates or you go to higher resolution. So if you go back to the graphic here, right, there's multiple things that make up video, right? And, um, and depending on as you move up on some of these things, they affect the size. If you go from HD to 8K, it's like going from a 2.2 megapixel image to a, what is it? What is it now? 32 megapixel, something stupid like that. Mm -hmm. 32, yeah, 32 megapixel. So each photograph is bigger. So resolution makes the file bigger. If I show you more pictures per second, that's gonna make the file bigger. If I give you more color data, um, more bit depth, that's gonna make the file bigger. Things such as brightness range and color space that is not impacted or um, by HDM. What do you say? Color space is just where on the um, where do you want the color map to? And brightness is um, is from white from super bright to dark. Neither one of those have any impact on size. When it comes to 2.1 over HDMI, um, the original HDMI um, 2.0B, the main difference is the, the increase in resolution up to 8K and the available frame rates up to 4K 120. Now that is a gaming thing. Right now, um, these gaming support um, should support eventually 8K60. 
theoretically. And but you can get 8K, 4K 120 from these type of gaming devices and graphics cards. But if you think about a movie watcher, um, Gene, what are most movies still shot in? 24 frames a second, right? Yeah. And you know why? Because people like the way it looks. The yep. reason why they went to 24 frames at the beginning was because film was expensive and that was the <laughs> slowest they could run the cameras and make it look like a human being is actually moving. So, and people have gotten used to it and that's what they like. So most of the studios still don't want to go up to the higher frame rates for a couple of reasons. Number one, more frame rates, higher frame rate means more film or bigger hard drives. Bigger hard drives cost money, right? Um, going to 8K means bigger hard drives. Bigger hard drives cost money. And if I make a 60 frame for 120 frame per second movie, all of the movie buffs will poo poo it, right? And 8K, there's no, I repeat, 8K professional displays at cinema. So I'm going to spend double the money to make a movie that I can't use in a movie theater. As much as you think, that they're making that movie for you to have it on Blu-ray or on Netflix. <laughs> no, they're making that movie to show it in back in the days pre-COVID, um, um, Edwards Cinema or AMC. So if there's no distribution of 8K, they're not really going to be game for it. And then the last thing, the TV manufacturers or the, the cable manufacturers, cable companies like to give you a thousand channels. They're not going to. They don't want to. They wouldn't even give up four. HD channels to give you one 4K channel. They're not going to give up 16 HD channels to give you one 8K channel, especially if there's not a lot to show on it. They may do one for testing, but the odds of you seeing TV shows in 8K or every movie coming in 8K in the near future is still slim to none. It is for it the when it comes to resolution and high frame rate it's still going to be kind of a gaming thing for a while. Well, quick question for you, Phil. Now that you, you mentioned pre-COVID about the priority being movie theaters for the releases, now that we're in a post-COVID world and we're streaming movies the same day they come out in the theaters, whether it's HBO Max or any mm -hmm. other streaming service, do you think that priority is going to change? Um, that's a good question. That would be, um, uh, um, but that still needs to depends on how many a, um, HDMI 2.1 available displays are there. And um, because it's it's almost like that chicken and egg, you know, mm -hmm. you, if there, if everything was 8K, um, maybe. Will you see start seeing a lot more 4K content, which you already are seeing? Yes, because there's we have hit critical mass for 8K enabled displays, um, receivers that pay. I mean, we have reached critical mass for 4K displays this, um, and devices that can pass 4K to the point where it, it's becoming kind of the standard, so you're starting to see more. It's going to be a while before 8K reaches that number that makes it a good business model for them to do it. They may do it just to say that they can. Um, internal services, like if you look at um, when I was at Sony, um, we launched the first 4K content in, from an internal service. And you also saw that with companies like Samsung. So I can see maybe an internal service or a proprietary service from a manufacturer supporting 8K on their AK TVs, so for look at me. Well, that's and that's where things like eARC is going to come in and is going to matter. But you getting a cable box and getting it is probably not going to happen for a while. Cable boxes still don't go beyond 1080i in my well, experience. Well, remember how long it took for us to get 1080p after that <laughs> came out? Mm -hmm. I mean, forever. Okay, exactly, exactly. Now, the other thing that got me, Gene, is people keep asking about the. Um, um, you can hide the slides. People keep asking about the Apple TV. Apple TV just announced that it has HDMI 2.1. Um, I think what's going to end up happening is chip manufacturers that make the boards that go on HDMI devices probably aren't, probably aren't going to continue to make 2.0 Bs and 2.1s. It's not a very good use of economy of scale, right? So I assume that the Apple TV has a 2.1, not because they're ready to show you 8K and 4K 120. It's because of the other advantages of 2.1, quick media switching, quick frame transport, um, uh, all of those capabilities. And why would I, uh, I'm buying so many, why would I buy the old chipset when I could buy the new one? Hmm. You know, so that's why I think, so people think, oh, the, the, new H, the new Apple TV has 2.1. 
AKs just are not magically going to appear there because where are they going to get the content? Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you look at our receivers right now, our receiver support, if you bring the chart back up, all of these different things. I will note that we have two, three different signal format adjustments on our receiver. Um, standard, um, enhanced, and and 8K. So think of standard as 10 gigabits per second, enhanced as 18 gigabits per second, and 8K enhanced up to 40 gigabits per second. Do not switch your receiver to 8K enhanced unless you have an HDMI 2.1 um enabled um device um or uh, um display because display and sources right and source actually this has to be the display oh, because okay. it um the receiver will upscale everything to 8k if you wanted to basically what you're doing here is we're going to talk about the ways that data goes down a line originally hdmi was done with correct me sam tmds right and now it is frl when you switch this to enhance, the communication between the receiver and your display device is an FRL. It can come in T TDMS, but it's gonna go out FRL. Does that make sense? And if, you're, if your display can't understand that because it's not an HDMI 2.1 display, you will get no picture. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So. So, um, and that's because of this. We were talking about these cables. If you look at HDMI cable, there's all these different things inside of a cable. Sam can tell you what every single one of these things are. I don't know them all, but I do know a little bit, okay? If you look at the big wires that look like little three little people smiling at you, that is where the data, um, the video data is sent, okay? Audio and other things like your 12 volt and everything else will go down different lines. Originally, there was three channels that were designated for video, um, channel zero, channel one, channel two. And then there was kind of a clock channel to make sure everything, the band played together. Each one of those channels could support in the old standard up to six. So six plus six plus six equals 18, which is why the band, weight, band rate, the band with limitations of HDMI 2.0B was 18. Yeah. And 18 was more than enough to support 4K 120 um, on a modern display in HDR. Um, now, this clock channel um, existed in your HDMI cable, right? So now what they did was they went to this type of scheme, where those, instead of having three TD TM TDMS channels plus a clock, now they use those four lanes for four lanes of video traffic. So how the cable is being utilized has changed. So you need to make sure that if you switch to um, this FRL communication, um, that both the display and the receiver, or if you have the TV plugged directly into your source, they are speaking the same language. Because you have like what, your source, your sync, um, actually, source, sync, and display. Is that right? No, source, repeater, and sync. How do you say it, Sam? He's hiding it'd from be, me. It would be a source, a repeater, and a sync, and the repeater yeah. device is just the AVR there. Exactly. Uh, if, you, if, if you go back a couple, actually, you can see that the fourth clock channel there in the uh, HDMI little circle diagram you had there. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, so you're going to go back to this wires. one? How about that yep. one? So that clock pair is actually the fourth TMDS channel, or it becomes a lane now in uh, HDMI 2.1 to help extend the bandwidth. And exactly. if you have a good built uh, HDMI 2.0 cable and they just made the clock pair uh, the same gauge as the rest of the TMDS, you should be able to utilize your old HDMI 2.0 cable uh, for 24 gigabit per second HDMI 2.1. Yeah, and that's a good point, Sam, because in our okay. building, um, uh, we have a lot of bullet train, which is AV Pro Edge um, cables. We have optical cables, long distance um, 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 fiber based cables. Like we have a 20, 20 meter and a 30 meter for this theater because it has an AK Sony TV and a JVC um, projector that's AK up on the ceiling. And we want to make sure that we had enough bandwidth for that. But then we also have a whole lot of passive cables that um, that, we're, that were provided as well. 
and and those cables can support more because of the quality. So when you're so so there's a lot of cables out there, HDMI cables. They all have these wires. But like he said, is that if that clock pair is of the same quality as the other TMDS pairs, you can easily push that cable past 18. And we'll talk about a lot of times, um, 48 is the maximum. But for many of the things that you're watching, you're not going to get anywhere near 48 or need to be um, up to 48 when it comes to HDMI. So, Sam, the big difference between a cable that'll pass this versus one that won't is the clock pair just doesn't have the same gauge wire as the TD TMDS pairs, right? So the good thing about FRL is that if you jump a couple slides ahead back to that link training, um, with the link training, what it'll actually do is it'll start to see if uh, your display can do 48 gigs. And if it can't do, it'll drop down to 40 gigs and all the way down until it figures out it can't do fixed rate link anymore. And then mm -hmm. it starts sending the uh, legacy TMDS transmission. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if your cabling doesn't support HDMI 2.1, there's a good chance that it'll just drop back down to legacy TMDS to get you a video signal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Now, Phil, you have a way of testing that with a Sound United receiver, right? Actually, we do. Um, there's a couple ways to test it. Um, if I, let me go back, I gotta go around my slides. I hope you guys don't mind. I got so many slides. I got so many slides, so many slides. Um, there's multiple ways to test it. One way would be if you have a really good test pattern system. Um, Meridio, which is the one of the sister company of AV Pro Edge, has a um, test pattern generator. Actually, if you go back, if you come off the slides, um, I have one right here. This is the new, um, uh, the Murray's and uh, gave me this. This is the new 7G 8K, which allows you to test um, um, and send and analyze those types of signals. So this is a generator. Um, so this generator, I can do things like uh, see, and I can see how the FRL, um, the bandwidth, I can test for, it's got 8K content in it. And it's got 4K 120 video content in it. So this sucker is pretty slick. Um, they also came out with a, a couple of little guys. If you bring up the next slide, they came out with these guys. It's an analyzer and a generator that you can te te test. Now, these work great. But, Sam, do you remember how much these cost? I mean, they're, they're a pretty penny. I think they're around six for the pair, uh, five yeah. to six for the pair. Yeah, so um, it's about right. five to six K. Yeah. So, yep. so if you're a professional... Or like me, I am a video calibrator. I have both sets because I'm using them not only for troubleshooting in the office, but also calibrating displays. But for many people, they just want to verify before they put the wires in the wall that the signal is going to get from point A to point B. Because the longer the HDMI cable becomes, the harder it is for it to pass data. So in our receivers, we have an HDMI diagnostics tool. And that tool allows you, you basically take the cable, you plug it into one of the inputs and the monitor out. There's a button push and the, it will test your cables up to 40. Now, the reason why we stop at 40 is because that's the limitation of our HDMI system that's built into our um, receivers. But that's also the limitation of the outputs of your gaming system and also the outputs of your display. Right. So if I go back here and we look at um, a video display, we go back, 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 back. Now, Phil, back. while you're looking for that slide, do we should you use the 8K input on your receiver to, or it doesn't matter? Um, to do the, to do that test, um, you need it, it's the uh, you need to use the 8K of the. See if I can find that slide. You need to use the um, the 8K output on the receiver. The instructions are explained. Up, oh, I don't okay. have the slide on this one. Um, basically, um, if you look at, um, data, uh, let's see if I can find this right here. Do, 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 so do, example, do. like the Marantz SR 8015 has one 8k, uh, input. That's the one you would want to use. Um, exactly. Now, um, a display, a modern display only has a 10 bit panel. And I, normally I have that slide. I forgot to put it in. I don't care if you get a projector, if you get a TV, most professional displays utilize a 10-bit panel. So if I was watching um, 4K at 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second, um, 
on a 10-bit panel. Um, the maximum is, where is it? I believe it's 40. If we go down here to yep. FRL5, right? 4K, sure. 120 frames per second, 444 for a 10-bit panel is 40. Any yep. more than that is nice, but it's like telling a, um, a car to go 300 miles an hour. It'll go as fast as it possibly can, but all of that extra shadow detail or color information that's that's provided by those other two bits, you won't be able to utilize. So if you look at it, 40 is the maximum for 4K at 120 frames per second. If we go down and we look under FRL 6, you will actually FRL um, 8, you'll see that um, 8K at 60 frames per second at 420, Still right, fine. which is the which is the standard for HDMI 2.1 on a 10 bit panel happens to be 40. So the theoretical um, 48, you could use it if you look at FRO6, but nothing out there. Sam, can you think of anything that supports as a video display? Actual being able to utilize all of that because there is no 12 bit yep. panels. So other than there's no 12 bit panels um, the closest you'll get is like uh, the LG Nano 99 that supports uh, 48 gigabits per second, but you'll only ever be able to utilize it with an NVIDIA graphics card or like one of the AMD uh, 5000 series. Yeah, it basically but but if we still go back to it now knows what you want, but the panel that's in the display is still 10 bit. <laughs> okay, so great. I can accept 48. And it looks really cool that I can accept 48. Just like you're telling me I can go 300 miles an hour, doesn't mean I could do it. All right. Well, Phil, are all 4K and 8K panels today 10 bit or are there some of the yes. cheap ones 8 bit? Okay. Um, well, there are some 8 bit panels that are still out there that use dithering or some sort of technologies. But the flagships, the big bad boys that everybody goes ooh and ah, and I wish I could have, those are 10 bit panels. Right. Okay. Um, and it, it may be a while before 12-bit panels come. You may have a flying car before you see a 12-bit panel. So, um, and the main thing is we want people to, um, you got to remember that we're going, going from 8-bit to 10-bit is a huge, huge amount of colors. You're going from, what, 16 million to over a billion? So, believe me, um, when you're looking at HDR, there's enough color, there's enough bit depth at 10 to hide um, most of um, any kind of gradations. When we get into, when there's 10,000 nit um, 12K, I mean 10,000 nit um, 12 bit displays, that's when you're gonna need it. But if you look at 10 bit, there's normally enough gradation information in there for you to see smooth skies and smooth gradations um, on a 4,000 nit display. That's when you get into a 10,000 nit display, which does not exist. I was going to say, how like you get that? Huh? <laughs> exactly. You might burn burn something if you had that. Exactly. Yeah, the sun has a backlight. Exactly. So, so we hear that all the time, 40, 40, 48, 48, 48. No, your magic number right now is 40, 40, 40, 40. And, um, and Sam, you guys offer passive cables that can support pass, pass for, yeah, 48 passive cables, correct? Yeah. Full 48 gig passive cables up to four meters. So the length of the uh, HDMI 2.1 is about five meters at max, which is around 15 feet. And uh, HDMI, uh, with the increase in bandwidth, uh, you also have an increase in the, uh, the uh, decrease in the length it takes to attenuate the signal to be unreadable. And so we um, we can't use long cables like we used to in HDMI 2 at 18 gig, which are usually around 10 to 15 meters. And we've really effectively half the capable passive transmission distance. So okay. now you got to go active or you got to do fiber or you got to do uh, HD base T or something like that if you want to yep. get to higher rates. And even then with HD base T, if we're going uh, to do like a retrofit, we need to make sure that we're pulling some shielded CAT 6A because uh, the CAT 5E and CAT six of the past just do not have the capacity to hold the uncompressed bandwidth of hdbs t 3.0 at 16 gigs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now yeah quick, you guys are working on have. some optical solutions too right yep um so we'll have eventually some uh, full 48 gig hdmi 2.1 extenders uh mm -hmm. that are just fiber based mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so Stan, fiber quick question i have for you a oh, lot sorry. more than that fiber supports what up to 100 
Um, so depending on what kind of fiber you're using, whether it be OM2, OM3, OM, up to OM5, uh, uh, OM4 and OM5 are starting to be able to support those 100 gigabit transmission distances. Um, OM3, which is where you're fine, the baseline, will support 40 gigs up to about 100 meters. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, so, so we were talking about things to, to prepare for the future because Don's an installer, he does all of these jobs. We used to always tell people back in the days when they were pulling coax, we were saying, dude, make sure you pull cat five, cat six. Yep. Now it's like pull all the, as many cat sixes as you possibly can and at least pull a piece of fiber because it's a lot cheaper to pull fiber now than go back into the wall and try to add it later. And if, if you, people fiber, are willing to pay for it, that's mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. If you know, people are, we run, we always run, uh, we, we do what's called a distributed video pre-wire where we do two cat sixes and we do a cat six shielded. Um, then we put an option for a fiber on there too, if somebody wants to pay for it, but you, or a piece of conduit, which is even better than all of them. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So, um, the, the, the fiber is your best solution. And what's the difference in how much does it cost per foot to, um, if you were doing a job, um, to add, um, 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 fiber to go along with um, like a pair of like the the pull the wall rated um, armored what they call it armored fiber what do you guys call it um, how much is that per foot I can tell you right now it's he's scary. looking it up I'm looking it up right now with the, through the magic <laughs> of the through the magic of the internet mm -hmm. so Sam one uh, question I have for you while Don's looking that up if you run an HDMI matrix in eight by eight for example right now they're like the AV Pro Edge stuff is limited to eighteen gigabits a second. Um, is there an upgrade path to that? Is it does it involve hardware or does it involve? It's a physical firmware? hardware change. So eventually, you would have to buy a new matrix. It's just the nature of the beast because the HDMI chipsets in there are all HDMI 2.0 anyways, so they'll never be upgradable. Um, there's not really a eight by eight matrixing solution that's done all the way yet and been released. But uh, recently, we released a four by two 40 gigabit per second HDMI 2.1 matrix switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the one I actually have the smaller 18 gig four and two out that I use in my lab for doing projector reviews. And I've already talked to um, these guys about getting the eight, the eight K piece. And that's so, because like it's a different, different, different chipsets. So about two to two to three dollars, three, three fifty a foot, depending on what fiber we pull. Okay. So, so say, like some, yeah. yeah. And you're not trying to pull. I don't think that you need, you know, to pull fiber to the bathroom for the, you no, know, no. or out outside for the pool, you know, for the TV over the next to the pool or something. Mm -hmm. But your main living spaces, <laughs> yeah. your your theater, your yeah. your um from the from the rack to your to your eighty five inch TV that's on your wall right mm -hmm. now, it you would be a dum dum, <laughs> not to <laughs> not to invest and, the extra few hundred dollars to mm -hmm. cover yourself because. Don coming back to cut a hole in your wall is going to cost way more oh, yeah. than if you had just oh, taken the time to, to pull it. it now, right? Or the de or the demarcation point. I mean, there's a you're absolutely right. There's to the to the main equipment rack or mm -hmm. sub racks if you have those, and and absolutely to your main master bedroom, TV, family room, media room, theater. It's it's a smart move to do that for sure. Exactly. So yeah. So so at least think about the spaces. Um, that you're going to utilize that you think may be the ones where you're going to really critically look at stuff and at least pull some fiber there. You may not be using it now, but you just want to make sure that um, you cover your base because that piece of fiber can not only send the video, but all of your internet and everything else down that one itty bitty piece of wire. Um, so it's just, it just makes sense that if you're trying to, I like, I have a saying, buy once, cry once, and you might as well just spend a little bit more to to cover to cover your bases so so um and that is an important that's an important thing um yeah so as, as rick was talking about like i said i, I want to stress that even though these fancy if i take this box right here it'll say that 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 you're out or the analyzer that's coming it'll say that hey your your panel your display so, so some Sony's and some some LG's um, and some Philips's can't support 48. But remember, the panel is 10 bit, <laughs> so you're getting so it's nice to have it, but it's but 
forty is what your panel is going to be able to be is going to be. So why do they advertise forty eight on the panel if if it's you? It's basically just a bragging right thing because you're not using yeah, full forty eight. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like like I said, it's like having a it's like having a car that with a speedometer that can read one hundred and sixty miles an hour, but it's a Volkswagen Bug. It's nice that it has all the information. Doesn't mean that you're ever going to be able to use it. You know, um, it's telling it to because how many? What's the difference in colors when you go from? Um, so we go from. 8-bit, you go from 16 billion, I mean 16 million to a billion. When you go from 10 to 12, Sam, what's the jump? It's like it's like we're about 60, 63 billion. Yeah. So you're so guess what? You're you're giving the the the, the TV 60 some 63 billion colors or some insane number, and it can only do a billion. It's nice that you're telling me about all of these. <laughs> and and someone them. like Don, someone like Don, who's kind of colorblind, he only sees about six colors. So. <laughs> <laughs> I see the color green. We hey, Gene, know. I wonder, I wonder if our Sony TVs are ten bit. Yeah, yeah. Have to, I will tell you yeah. all, all. Um, th 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 let's go back to this because I used to be a, I used to be a display guy too, and yeah. I still deal with displays on a day to day basis for my night gig. Um, all the displays, they're basically there's only two or three manufacturers that are the prime manufacturers of panels. Okay. There's only a few companies, maybe two, that make OLED panels, and there's probably three that make LCD panels. And what's in their inventory is 10 bit. <laughs> okay. okay. It's cool. what, what separates a TV is the chef's ability to take all the ingredients, the mm -hmm. backlight system, the panel, the inputs, the the Google or you know, the Google Android TV or smart features, and come up with the best recipe. But the ingredients are the ingredients, okay? Um, and the ingredients right now, that one ingredient is only a 10-bit panel. Sorry. So it's a like, quick fun like, fact. Like Taco Bell. <laughs> a quick fun fact for anyone that's a Dan and a Morantz owner. If you hit the info button on the remote control, the first time you hit it, it'll tell you the audio format, whether you're in Atmos or you're in Dolby Digital Plus or anything like that. You hit it again, it'll tell you the resolution and the amount of bits. Exactly. And if you go deeper into the menu, if I can find it here, we have a data menu that if you go deeper into the menu that will give you all of the additional information yeah. um we're going to talk about in a second and we need to cover it is there's more to hdmi 2.1 than just frame rate and resolution there's a lot of um, features to enhance gaming experiences and user experience and even audio and you need to be able to see what's being sent because because the receiver is a repeater in between the source and the sink it will tell you what's coming and what's going. So these menus are found, if you go deeper into the menu section, it will show you what's coming in and what's going out, okay? So that is something that's really, really good. So you can check all of the other, all of the other features. So, so let's talk real quickly about um, the other things that are coming, that, that are included in HDMI 2.1 that we need to talk about as well that has nothing to do with um, with the um, band, um, this huge 48 bandwidth. And the first so, thing so is- So Phil, you could get that kind of information even on your entry level receivers too? Yes, yes. One thing, we use the same HDMI um, uh, system in all, of our t in all of our receivers. So if it's an 8K enabled receiver, I don't care if it costs $600, or five thousand dollars. Those features are that 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 information is available. We don't separate when it comes to the type of graphics that we use. And so, there's there's twenty or thirty thousand dollar processors that won't give you that kind of information. That's just right, Don. That's pretty know, amazing. The other way to get it is right here. This will give it to you. But this is yep. about <laughs> six or seven grand, right? Yep. That that's, guy, that's that device, guy right yeah. there. I'll I just borrow guy. Jason Dustles. He'll let me borrow his. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, let's talk about this because we because we it's amazing how quickly you could use up your HDMI time. So um, there's some other things that are part of the HDMI 2.1 standard that's going to give you a better experience. Um, variable refresh rate, quick frame transport, auto latency mode. So let's talk about variable refresh rate. Um, everybody has these fancy computers, right? And the computer basically has to draw the image um, that you're going to be watching. And if it's just me standing in front of a white background, pretty easy for that computer to draw. But if it's me standing in front of a bunch of trees or a bunch of buildings, it's going to take longer for that, um, for, that project, for that TV to draw it. 
So what ends up happening, I'm not going to get rid of all of this. That's too much tech. We'll just get rid of that. Go back to the best slide um, because we're not going to do a formal presentation. Basically, what happens now is the display and the source communicate. The source, as soon as the source is done drawing whatever it needs to make, it tells the, it sends it to the display to be displayed. So if it's something really simple, it can draw maybe 120 frames per second. If it's something more complex, depending on your computer's processing power, it may only draw 63. What does that mean? All of you guys out there saying, oh, my game system supports 4K 120. You know what? When you're playing some game, most likely, and you're looking at variable refresh rate, the odds of you hitting that 4K 120 is slim to none because your computer does not have the processing power to draw some huge battle scene at 120 frames per second with ray tracing and everything else. So this basically ensures that the TV slows down and, and waits for the image to be drawn. If the TV does not slow down, the image will be halfway drawn and then the next one will go and it'll start drawing, end up with tearing. So you want the display the weight, okay? So that's for gaming, that's a gaming thing. It ensures that you get the smoothest, um, lag-free um, game experience with no tearing. The next one, quick frame transport. Think of that as a conveyor belt. Right now, um, there's a conveyor belt with little trays in it in your HDMI 2.0 B, 2 B world. And it didn't matter how fast the computer could draw the image or the display could, or the source could draw the image. It had to wait for the next slot to put it into on that conveyor belt. So say I was making a, a teddy bear. I made the teddy bear. I had to wait until the next bin showed up to put the teddy bear in. Didn't matter how fast I could, I could make a teddy bear. With this, the, there's no box. There's nothing on the conveyor belt. It's just a conveyor belt. And as fast or as slow as I make a teddy bear, I can send that data off to the display. As a gamer, what does that mean? I have, a, I have a system that has this, you do not. Both computers can draw the frame at the same time. Your display is waiting. My display has already sent the data off. I see you before you see me, and you're dead. It's a gaming advantage when you play video games. And that also leads to that auto latency mode. All of our um, Denon and Marantz receivers have had game modes in them for years, at least three years. Most TVs have game modes, but you have to manually change them. Now, I'm watching Netflix on my game system. It has all the video stuff on. The second I start playing a game, it sends a trigger to the, to the display and the receiver, and they both switch to game mode. So what you get is optimum viewing when you're watching Netflix or movies on your gaming device and optimize gaming because it goes into game mode automatically. You don't have to do it. So those are two st things that are part of HDMI 2.1. Um, the last two, I'll go through all that, blah, 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 is um, um, quick media switching. This is why I think Apple put that on their display. If you look at an Apple, uh, normally when you switch from one frame rate to another, I believe, is that right, Sam? You get the black, it has to like recommunicate and you get that, yep. black, you get that black frame, right? You, you may see a black frame. It may drop out entirely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and and if you look at Apple TVs when they first came out of the box, it made everything 4K and 60 frame, 4K HDR 60 frames per second. Because whenever you went from the menu system to a TV show, customers would see the, the picture go blank, and they were assuming that the system was broken. And if you have a projector, a lot of times that blank screen takes forever yep. to come back. So what this is is. Um, when you switch from one frame rate to another, it doesn't have to verify rights, basically. So you don't get the blackout. And I think Apple did it more for that type of stuff than they ever did it for, and maybe the, like we talked about, the, uh, the, um, the uh, fr quick frame transport and the variable refresh rate for an Apple TV more than the AK. Last thing, enhanced audio return channel. This is what can burn you with HDMI. Enhanced audio return channel. We said that those applications are going to be that a first 8K are going to be in the TV. Well, now you got to get the audio from the TV back to your receiver, right? Um, HDMI cables, good HDMI cables that have an ether um, with Ethernet option will send that back. Um, a lot of balance will not. 
So all of a sudden you have this beautiful um, video, but you can't get the Dolby Atmos back to your receiver uncompressed. So that's the biggest challenge is um, enhanced audio return channel. When the it other thing, the other thing, Phil, is some uh, some TVs only support the enhanced audio return channel on one of the HDMI inputs, and it's usually not the input that supports the best re video resolution. Exactly, exactly. So the we all of our receivers have supported enhanced audio return channel from from, from a way back. In this room right now, I actually have a um, AV8805, not an A, just an AV8805, and the reason why I have that is because I have an 8K TV. That Sony big 8K TV Master Series is probably going to get an app with 8K content. And because I have a good optical cable from Bullet Train, I can send that eARC back to that rack and I can have 8K on my display from the display's internal application. And I could still have uncompressed Blu-ray quality audio being sent back to my AVR. I'm going to upgrade it to an A because I got a gaming system and the gaming system is gigantic. So it has to sit in the front next to the TV, plugged into the TV. So now I can send the, the, the signal from the game system. It's a big desktop back to the receiver for surround sound so we can play driving games in, um, in 8K or 4K 120 and still have an Adobe Atmos. But this is a what challenge. A that little eARC thing right here is yeah. a massive challenge when you talk about long distances. Yep, this one, especially um, even with active optical cables, I found that eARC transmission being 40 times the bandwidth of the previous ARC transmission can only be extended using an AOC cable about 20 meters. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that's for full True HD, full DTSX. Exactly. And then when you look at um, most of these senders, most of these inexpensive HDMI extenders do not support it, you yeah. know, at all, you know. Um, so it all depends on the type of cable that you use. Um, you guys have several that will support it. Um, you can actually see ARC, at least ARC. You want your cable to, you want your Balan or your HDMI cable to support at least ARC. eARC is preferred, right? ARC will yeah. still transmit Atmos, right? Yeah, ARC uh, will... It It'll Good. be the Dolby Digital Plus version of the Atmos. So well, you won't get a kind of Blu-ray yeah. quality, but you'll get sort of the uh, streaming quality that you're seeing become more familiar on internal apps. Exactly. And so DTS, Phil, right now there's nothing that's streaming in true HD. No. Well, what this is for, Gene, is like I said, say I get some hardcore gaming PC yeah. or it's some really good app. Like, um, for example, Sony is getting ready to add... Um, a big service full of IMAX Enhance, which is DTSX Pro content. In order to get that back, you got to use ARC. You got to use eARC if you want to maximize the quality of that. Um, DTS, a lot of times, DTSX and DTSX Pro, IMAX Enhance um, is not available a lot of times on, uh, on the just ARC. They want to use eARC to get, to get the best quality back because DTS has less compression, audio compression, than Dolby Atmos does. So you want eARC. eARC is your friend, is your friend. And if you go into these cables, it says support ARC. These cables support eARC, you know. So does these cables, you know. So you guys, so that's that's an important point, you know. A hundred meters, which is crazy. Um, wow. So I will tell you about these cables. I'll give you a chip. They are directional. Why are they directional, Sam? Um, they're realistically just a fiber transmitter and receiver pair, but all bundled into a single uh, HDMI cable that can be powered using the just HDMI port of the source and sink. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And make sure you use the adapter because I had this building done and the installers. I um I have this I had the projector on the ceiling and the and and the receiver when I switched to the projector, it would never come up. It would never come up. It would never come up. And I couldn't figure it out. And then I basically took the source and I plugged the source to the projector and it came up. And I was like, what's going on? Then I looked at it and said, oh, they didn't put – these come with a little outboard um, – um, every HDMI um, out, uh, input on a, a display has a little 5-volt power that's supposed to power these types of cables. A lot of times they're not enough. So this cable comes with a – almost like a little outboard dongle 
that is powered by a almost like a cell phone charger. Yep, it's just a five volt power inserter there. It just provides supplemental amperage to power the cables. Uh, as the technology has kind of improved, we now have a low power module version of this that doesn't even at any case require the module. Oh, that's uh, cool. But we still do include it just in case because it's just a nice handy tool to have around for any active yeah. optical cable. Exactly. So so my cable was 30 meters and the it was a JVC RS3000. It just didn't have enough voltage for the receiver to even recognize that the that the that there was a projector there and the second i put this little adapter in it worked okay so sam why would you use balums at this point if you could, can you run this behind drywall or you can't run pre-terminated uh, cables like this behind drywall right you can run pre-terminated cables like this behind drywall the difficulty kind of comes with the non-detachable heads so getting through conduit is a little bit more difficult especially if mm -hmm. you're using a, a metallic conduit rather than like a smurf tube or something similar uh, that has a little bit more leeway uh they're plenum rated so you can run them in drop ceiling as well uh and uh the new one i think is uh cmpl uh rating to um that's mm -hmm. becoming an industry standard that kind of covers all the uh cl1 and plenum ratings such as that mm -hmm. and i think having the ability to custom cut your links that you need is kind of nice too because um i bought 30 meter but i probably didn't need a 30 meter i probably could have got a buy with a 23 meter right mm -hmm. so being able to get it exactly um get the length exactly right um, and be able to pull it um, uh, as fiber and then add balance to it in the future and uh, upgradability of remember because remember right now um, the upgradability um, portion of it as well um, because you can, they may be because these cables can support up to 100 100 what um, fiber can support over 100 or up to 100 you yeah. never know so you these mean. these cables have four strands of om2 in them so mm -hmm. what you can do is you can cut the heads off and then you've got a four strand micro distribution uh, fiber kit that you can run too, whether, you know, potentially eight years down the line where the heads goes out and uh, you just need to reuse the fiber that you already have there, you can cut it and uh, reuse the cable. Okay. Oh, so cool. you can do that. So you just basically cut it, end up with a, with a standard piece of cable, which is, which is, that's pretty, that's pretty slick. So, yeah, but um, I always joke that, uh, oh, this is an interesting one too. Um, I have guys that always ask me about, hey, um, I'm, I'm still having problems with, with HDR, you know, with regular 4k 60 B HDR. Cause they, cause they, they had a cable in their wall that was done, um, back in the days and they're like, Oh, I, now I got to pull it out. Well, this, there are some little tricks like this little guy from Metra. Well, actually it's almost, it tries to, it basically turns your passive copper cable into an active copper cable. Is it going to work hundred percent of the time? No. But it's a hell mary before um, you you try to pull another wire for those guys that already had a cable in the wall and now they're going from um, um, SDR to HDR. Um, I think they're working on one of these even for to accelerate up faster for HDMI 2.1 stuff. But like I said, as they get um, the link, the effective link gets less and less and less. Um, we've already talked about verifying, regardless of what you're using, make sure you verify. Um, I have Fox and Hounds and 6Gs and 6As, and I love my new 7G, but all of those things are important as well. Um, and uh, we could test it with the receiver. This is kind of really, really cool. Um, now, I get someone ask, you know, why does the Denon and Marantz um, receivers only have one HDMI 2.1 input? Well, when the chipsets came out, there were um, there is a chipset. That support that is 2.1 that supported at the time more than one input, but it was limited to 24 meg um, gigabits per second. So we looked at it and said um, um, that we we wanted the we wanted the the maximum that was available at that time, and it's still kind of which is 40. So we chose the option with the multiple ends with the with the with the with the one end um, and two out versus the one that had um, mul um, multiple ends because it did not support the bandwidth we were looking for. We real, um, we're working on solutions and there will be solutions. In fact, even Sam already has a switching solution that you can actually add if you need more. But let's be honest, how many, unless you are a gamer with two game systems, it's gonna be a while before we have this conversation. And most guys are either hardcore Xboxes 
are hardcore PlayStations. They're not all. I'm not. Most guys aren't gonna have an Xbox, a PlayStation, and a graphics card. I think we did a survey of how many people that did that. I think globally we came up with a total of six. <laughs> so, oh wow! I, so I digress. I have all three. <laughs> well, you're a geek, and you're a test, and you're and most of the time you got them for testing, right? Nerd alert! Nerd alert! <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I have multiples too. But there are some people that are out there and there are going to be and there are going to be um, solutions for that, okay? From either us or third party for those for those customers. But for us to do that um, at the time, um, it the cost the cost the cost up on the receiver would have meant we'd have to remove something else. And how um and we figured that um, one would be a great start for and it would solve the needs for most customers and we could spend more of that money on things such as DTSX Pro, you know, yeah. um, and stuff like that. Or not shrink the power supply. Or not shrink the power supply. You only have a certain <laughs> amount of money to buy the recipe, to buy the parts <laughs> to go in your recipe. And we figured that this was the best way to do it. Okay. All right. So, so multiple <laughs> game people that have multiple yeah. gaming platforms yeah. can use the inputs on their TV to. to exactly. And we talk yeah. about that too. Um, but most, um, like for example, um, you could do something like, oh, let me go back here if I can find the slide. Something like this, where you could plug one into the into the into the receiver and one into the into the um, like in our in our room we're going to do this because the computer is too big to put in the rack, so it's going to be plugged into the TV, and then I'm going to get a PlayStation to go in the rack. Ta da! I got my two gaming devices. So. So there's ways to do it. Okay, that was a that was an important point. That was a, I always get asked that question. Yeah, well, we realize, Vinny, that there are some minority. There are the minority of hardcore gamers, like you and Sam, that have three devices. <laughs> you I'm open still, a can of worms. You got three? Can you hook a brother up? I'm still trying to get one. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I can't get an Xbox or a PlayStation to save my life right you, now. You and me both. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anything? I'm just going through the questions. Anything else, Gene, that we should talk about? No, I mean, I think we, you know, we hit the major topics here. Um, bottom line is, first of all, I would use the diagnostic tool if you have a Sound United receiver. Make sure your cables are good before you start installing any of this. Exactly. Um, and Don will tell you that the worst thing is to go all the way through a job and that the at the last minute plug it in and it doesn't work. Yep. You, know? You, you know it. So, Phil, the other question I have, and I just found this out recently, um, I was hooking up a system for my uh, sister-in-law, and I was trying to use the the ARC, not even eARC, and there was no sound coming to the receiver, and even though the receiver was uh, ARC capable, and then I mm -hmm. found out that the Sony TV that we have, it's actually the same TV Don and I have, mm -hmm. only the Output 3 supports eARC or ARC, whereas mm -hmm. Output two is really the optimal output for video. Why? For video. What was the point of that? I mean, <laughs> I do not know, but I will tell you that if you look at every TV, you have to use the one that's labeled ARC. And sometimes it could have been just the fact that their chipset that they chose, um, they had to make that option. But in order for ARC to work, you have to use the one that's labeled ARC. The other thing too, on 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 some manufacturers, you cannot separate ARC. From, custom, from CEC, which custom integrators think is the devil. I don't want the TV taking control of my, of my system. So like a lot of times you have to have C, like I know um, LG still got to have the CEC capabilities um, enabled. And I think Sony too, you still got to have Bravia Sync enabled in yeah. order for eARC to work. The good news is, um, or what we suggest is always going into every other display device, every other source device and turn it off. So turn it off on your on your Apple TV, turn it off on your Blu-ray, turn it off on your Roku, turn it off on your game. Then you can go into our receiver and the receiver has the ability to set to um to say that I want to accept eARC but I want to ignore the control. So basically you turn off everything else and the TV can make all the requests in the world and no one's going to pay attention. All right? Mm -hmm. So so that's the thing that you'd have to do. But it has to be on in order for you to get arc I know a lot of installers think that ARC and eARC is the devil, but the fact is it's the future. A lot of people are getting their content from the internal sources of their displays. Yeah. And if you use optical, you're going to get stereo and pro logic. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's most, true. most of the time. You've got to have to start 
embracing arc and e arc. Just turn so, off. So well, Phil, a lot it, of that was the control system set up too. Yeah, you know yeah. how to land everything, but they're they're working on that. So I agree with you. And, so and, uh, Phil, and, is there any advantage to using the apps inside the TV as opposed to buying a 4K Apple or 4K Roku streaming? Well, it, all, it all depends because I've um, um, sometimes the apps in the internal dis displays, like for example, there's a new one coming from Sony um, for their high end TVs that are going to support 100 megabit per second. You know, video that's better than CD. It's better than Blu-ray. You know, you wow. may want to use that guy, right? Um, mm -hmm. Some services. Um, may have Dolby Atmos or DTSX capability in the internal service. I always say I have an Apple TV, I have a Roku, and I have my Sony TVs and my other devices. And I look at each app, and then I see which one um, offers the best audio and things like that, and that's the one that I utilize. I am right. I am device agnostic. I just want to get the best performance possible. The other thing to remember, too, is if you're using the apps on your TV – this has always killed me because my mom has an older Sony. I couldn't get anything beyond two channel unless I went in and first disabled the speakers. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Arc automatically disables this internal speakers. Some on some TVs it does, and then it'll mm -hmm. default to multi-channel output. Mm -hmm. But I found on other TVs you have to go and physically disable the speakers so you have multi-channel mm -hmm. output through your HDMI or through exactly. Toslink. And also, and and because uh, what happens is uh, the. The, a lot of times that information is pulled from the signal um, uh, a little further down the line. And if it sees it as stereo speakers, it's already made its conversion to two channel mm. to play the two little speakers. So you got to say no speakers, you know, no speakers. Don't mess with the signal. Don't mess with the signal. So, so again, guys, if you have if you use an arc through the TV, hit the info button on your Sound United receiver. Make sure you're getting multi-channel. That's my biggest pet peeve. Anytime I'm streaming something on Netflix or something, I always just give a check just to make sure I'm in multi-channel and I'm not in some weird two-channel mode or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Yeah, and I will mention, I'm looking at some of the comments. You know what? The, 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 um, there's a lot of potential when it comes to HDMI. Um, every manufacturer, whether it's Sound United, Sony, LG, I have here, I see all the comments. Everybody is working to try to make it work as seamlessly as possible. It's a new technology. Um, it's going to continue to get better via firmware updates and things that we learn. So I know for you installers out there, for you consu consumers, it can get a little frustrating um, with some things working and some things don't. But just know that every manufacturer, um, including Sound United, is aware of, of the issues and are working to make sure that um, regardless of whatever source you're playing, regardless of every TV you're connected to, um, mm -hmm. It's going to work, but some TVs have their quirks. Some receivers have their quirks. Is just currently the the state of of digital. Welcome to the world of digital. You know. Yeah. So, well, I've got uh, we've got a playlist on our YouTube channel of other HDMI 2.1 stuff we've done with you, Phil. Mm -hmm. You also have a lot of this information on the Sound United YouTube uh, training. Uh, area on YouTube that I'll link to in the bottom below if you guys want to hear more information on this topic. Um, Sam, appreciate you being here from AV Pro Edge. We love your gear. I'm going to be doing some video coverage on what we did in this house because we're using an 8x8 matrix and we got a bunch of balums and you know Don's basically having me set up a system where I could project anything from Roku or anything from Apple TV to any TV in any part of the house. It's really an awesome tool to have if you can do it. And we'll be doing some video coverage on that in the near future. Um, is there anything else you guys want to add before we wrap this up? No, no, no. But I would say yeah, definitely check out check out um, uh, AV Pro Edge. Um, they make some really they make some really sick stuff. Our building also that runs it has a sixteen by sixteen in here, uh, and we're using it to to run a variety of other of other things. And of course, um, like 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 Gene says, um, I'd love to see you on my Sign United uh, YouTube. Um, uh, services. So check out our sign at it um, YouTube channel. We also do live webinars with guys like Sam. Uh, and if you want to find those, that is on this look under signited.com forward slash webinars. And we've had guys like DTS, um, Odyssey, um, IMAX. Um, I'm going to have, I'm going to have um, Matt Murray from AV Pro Edge and all those guys. So if you want to see what's coming live and those sessions go for two, three hours, and all of those wow. comments and questions that are in that tab, we try to answer all of them during those sessions. So, so please check that out as well because we are trying to make sure 
at Sound United, working with companies like Audio with like Audioholics and Don and 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 partners like um, AV Pro Ed to give you the information you need to get the best experience possible. All right. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, Sam, thanks for being here. Phil, again, thanks for uh, leading this conversation. And Don, mm -hmm. it's always awesome to have your thanks, expertise brother. involved in the stream. Mm -hmm. I think we are wrapped up here. Guys, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Hit that bell notification so you know when we're doing these live streams. We're going to be doing another one today. I think it's around 4.30 we're going to do the next mm -hmm. one. And it's going to be on the future of home theater entertainment. Yeah. We're talking lasers and lasers. holograms. <laughs> lasers. <laughs> yeah. You're going to lasers. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Care, guys. Well, and, and don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get access to us if you want to ask about video topics you'd like to cover in the near future. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. Keep listening. Adios. <laughs>